This video is part of a series offering a short introduction to Anglo-Saxon England. This first part will present a timeline. Our period begins a little nebulously in the 4th and 5th centuries AD, or CE, which is Common Era. Around this time, some Germanic tribes people migrated from the continent to what we now call England, which was then inhabited by the Celts. I have two maps that show possible reconstructions of where the Germanic people might have originated and settled. I would like to give full credit, but I am somewhat hampered here by the attribution, my work, without a name. As you can see, settlers came from different parts of the continent to different parts of England, and they probably did not all speak the same language. They were also not Christian, although we know relatively little about their beliefs. Here's a second reconstruction, a little different. Older sources may tell you, following the Venerable Bede, about whom more later, that the Germanic people who came were warriors hired as mercenaries to protect the Celts in what is now England from other Celts from outside. That may be at least partly true. Yet Bede also paints a picture of mercenaries then overwhelming and conquering the Celts, slaughtering them and pushing them out. More recent research does not support this depiction. Instead, Evidence from burials, DNA, and other sources shows that a small number of Germanic migrants, mostly men, intermarried with Celts, mostly women. By about 500, we start to talk of the beginnings of Old English as the different Germanic languages or dialects developed into a new language. Celtic appears to have had very little effect on Old English outside of place names, which is one reason why Bede's depiction of Germanic invaders destroying and pushing out Celts remained popular into the 20th century. We do not know why, when Celts survived in large numbers, their language was pushed to the margins of England and did not have a noticeable effect on Old English. Their effect on place names, however, does indicate ongoing importance. The English did not develop a unified kingdom yet, but had several kingdoms, and there were some tribes between and among kingdoms. Look here especially at the Heptarchy from the time of Bede. We have seven major kingdoms. And we have individual tribes in between, as I've mentioned. Now these Germanic newcomers were not Christian, though some of the Celts were. Around 597, Pope Gregory the Great, Gregory I, sent a missionary named Augustine, later known as Augustine of Canterbury, to convert the Anglo-Saxons to Christianity. Augustine had some help in Celts who were already Christians, although Bede mentions them very little except for queens. By the time of Bede himself, writing in 731, England had largely been Christianized. I'm brushing over huge parts of a complex story here. If you have time and interest, I highly recommend reading Bede's Ecclesiastical History of the English People. More than one good translation is available. And I continue to skip over large amounts of history to another big moment, the beginning of Viking raids in the 790s. But before that, we should get a look at what England is. So around the time of Bede, we have multiple kingdoms. In the 790s, the Vikings are going to start raiding, and they're going to face what is mostly becoming a Mercian supremacy. Mercia, this kingdom that had been here, has taken over much of the middle of the island, leaving only Northumbria and Wessex separate. So this is around the year 800. But the Viking raids begin. Attackers from what would become Norway, Sweden, and Denmark hit coastal areas in England, Scotland, and Ireland, mostly hit and run. Before long, however, some Vikings began to stay longer and longer. Armies began to winter in the British Isles. Some people began to settle. There is evidence for Viking women and even children. Some Viking men also intermarried with Celtic and Anglo-Saxon women. By the reign of Alfred the Great, 871 to 899. Vikings had conquered Northumbria 
and Anglia. So these areas had fallen under the Vikings, and they were making serious inroads into Mercia, where they removed one king and helped put another in his place. So Alfred comes to a throne of a kingdom that's largely in this area. Cornwall is not fully under his control, most likely. And then the Vikings continue to attack and push in on him. If you have seen The Last Kingdom, though much is fictional in that, Alfred really did flee into the swamps a few years after he took the throne. But by the end of the reign, he had taken control of what had been Wessex and became a larger Wessex and much of what had been Mercia. Mercia was no longer governed by a king, but by a lord and lady. That lady, the first lady, was Alfred's daughter, Ethelfled. Lady Ethelfled was an important figure in the fortification and defense of Mercia for a number of years. Alfred the Great's reign also stands out for the king's involvement in the production of literature. Alfred tells us himself in a letter that, in sorrow at the poor state of learning in England, he commissioned translations from Latin, the language of learning at the time, into Old English. He also did some himself, although some scholars dispute that claim. His reign certainly fostered the growth of Old English prose, both in translations and in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, a year-by-year -year account of the history of England begun during Alfred's reign, but looking back to the first Roman attempt to take England in 60 BC or BCE, before Common Era, and then going up into Alfred's reign. Several copies were made, and these diverged in the late 890s as different people updated them in different places, some for centuries. The four great poetic codices, manuscripts or handwritten books containing the majority of surviving Old English poetry, were all written in the next century, roughly between 960 and 1000. Many of the poems may predate these physical books, but dating Old English poetry is fraught with difficulties. Meanwhile, Alfred's son and grandson united what had been multiple kingdoms and then Viking control plus Wessex into one kingdom of the English, driving out the Vikings, conquering the whole for their throne. At roughly the same time as the poetic codices were being created, the Benedictine reform came to England, a new emphasis on monasticism under a specific rule accompanied by the introduction of more art, liturgical reforms, and music from the continent. King Ethelwald, a major patron of the reform, died in 984. England continued to have battles and even wars with Vikings, and one Danish king, Knut, even became king of England. The big disruption was yet to come, however. In 1066, the Normans invaded England. The Normans were a northern French people descended from Vikings rather like those who had attacked England. Their leader, William the Bastard, killed the English King Harold, who had quite a brief rule. William became known as William the Conqueror, or William I of England. The English warrior class, the ruling class, was largely wiped out. The men were killed, exiled, or fled. Norman, or Northern French, aristocrats, were installed in their place, even in church offices. Between 1100 and 1200, Old English became Middle English. It happened gradually, with the changes heavily influenced by the Norman French spoken by the new ruling class. I have given here an extremely condensed timeline, with an emphasis on moments of particular interest to me and my classes, but I hope you found it helpful. I have two other videos on lifestyles of the Anglo-Saxons and on Anglo-Saxon government, religion, and learning. Thank you for watching.